on different parts of the lead sphere. The three observables are phi VDSS, the phase shift of SSPMP, A VDSS, the amplitude of SSPMP, and P VDSS, the travel time of SSPMP. After discussing those three observables, we will combine what we learned from the previous sections to do a case study of the slave craton to see what we can, what geologic sense we can make uh, using this new method. First, what is VDSS? In VDSS, we use S-wave generated by tidal se seismic events. The ray of the S-wave dive into the Earth's interior and come back to reach the station from under, be, underneath. Now, let's zoom into the region around the station where the Earth can be approximated as being flat. Our tidal seismic S-ray approaches the free surface and converts to down going P wave at a place called virtual source. We call it virtual source because it's equivalent to the true source in active source reflection seismology. The down going P ray will undergo post critical reflection at the moho and finally reach the station. This makes our SSPMP phase. By measuring the travel time difference between SSPMP and SS, we can estimate the crustal thickness with the assumed average crustal VP, very similar to what people traditionally do in active source seismic reflection experiments. Because the, post, because the critical velocity, the, or the velocity at which post-critical reflection happens, is determined by the reciprocal of the ray parameter, or 1 over p, we want to have the correct range of ray parameter to make sure that this reflection happens at the moho, not in the lower crust or in the upper mantle. Here is the ray parameter of tidal seismic S waves as a function of epicenter distance. On the right hand side, we plot the reciprocal of the ray parameter, 1 over p. Because we don't want our SSPMP to happen uh, on the top of lower crust, we want to block out the range of lower crust of VP. We also don't want post-critical reflection to happen in the upper mantle, so we want to block out the upper mantle VP as well. This leaves us with a range between 35 degree and 50 degree, which is the typical range used in SSPMP. Now, let's look at some simple synthetic waveforms. The left-hand side shows the model used to compute the synthetic waveforms. On the right side, and on the right hand side, we show the computed waveforms. We separate the waveforms into S and P components using a particle motion analysis algorithm so that SS and SSPMP will show up on different components. The first thing we notice here is the high amplitude of SSPMP. It's almost comparable to the amplitude of direct SS due to the post-critical reflection. This high, high amplitude makes it possible for us to estimate the crustal thickness using only one event. This is very different to, from what people do in receiver function analysis, where we need to stack a number of receiver functions to make the moho PS <laughs> stand out uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the noises. A second thing we notice here is the phase shift of SSPMP, as evidenced by the different waveform of SSPMP compared with SS. Later on, we'll show that this phase shift can be used to constrain velocity in the lower crust and upper mantle. And finally, we can measure the travel time of SSPMP, T VDSS, by taking the time separation between the peaks of the two envelope functions. After seeing the synthetics, let's look at some real data. Here, I'm showing the same data set used by Chun Quan in his 2012 paper. A linear array is deployed across the boundary between the Ordos Plateau and the, active, and the tectonically active region to the east of it. They record two deep focus events from the Banda Sea, and here the stars show the virtual source locations. A little bit of geologic background here. 
the Urdu's plateau is regarded as a remnant of the Archean North China Craton. The eastern part of the North China Craton, the area to the east of this boundary, is thought to undergo reactivation during Mesozoics. The, array, the linear array was deployed here across the boundary between stable craton, Oros plateau, and the tectonically active region to study the process of craton re reactivation. Here are the record section across this profile. We again separate the data into S and P components. We also align all traces to the direct SS arrival so that the SSPMP arrival time here is directly proportional to the crustal thickness. The most striking feature here is the drastic increase of TVDSS at from 113 degree east to 111 degree east. Nominally, this corresponds to an increase in crustal thickness from 30 kilometers to 60 kilometers. This is the main observation in Chen Chuan's paper. However, when I look at individual traces, there are more interesting features we can find. Now let's zoom in to those three traces along the profile. First, we observe a significant change in SSPMP amplitude. <coughs> the amplitude of JB13 is almost two times higher than JB09. In addition, we also observe a significant change in phi VDSS, the phase shift. The phase shift here at FY03 is close to zero degree, which means that the SSPMP waveform is very similar to SS. <coughs> However, at station JB13, the phase shift is close to 90 degree. We want to understand what's the factors that is causing this this change in AVDSS, VDSS, and TVDSS. <coughs> Obviously, those <coughs> changes should be caused by near receiver structure, not the, not, the, not, not the earthquake sources, because the aperture of the array is, is, is really small compared to the distance between the array and the events. In the following sections, we'll explore the dependence of TVDSS, AVDSS, and VDSS <coughs> on different lithospheric structures. First, let's look at VDSS. Because SSPMP is the reflection happening on the interface between lower crust and the upper mantle, it's natural to guess that VDSS is controlled by lower crust velocity and upper mantle velocity. We are using 1D waveform synthetics to test our hypothesis. In those models, we fix the VP in the crust while varying the VP in the upper mantle. The blue trace here corresponds to the blue model here, and the green trace up corresponds to the green model here. As we vary upper mantle VP, we observe a significant change in SSPMP phase shift, as evidenced by the change in waveforms here. This can be seen more clearly when we separate out the SSPMP wavelet. However, as we increase the ray parameter from 0.125 to 0.13, it seems that the effects of upper mental VP on SSPMP phase shift, shift decrease significantly. This implies that ray parameter also plays a big role here. We then did a more comprehensive study <coughs> on the dependence of phi VDSS. In this plot, I'm showing phi VDSS as a function of upper mantle VP and lower crust of VP. When ray parameter equals 0.125 seconds per kilometers. The color in this plot shows the value of phi VDSS and the black curves shows the equal, equally spaced contours for phi VDSS. As we increase upper mental VP and lower crust of VP, in general, phi VDSS decrease. However, more importantly, the dependence of phi VDSS also change with the two parameters. 
when the incremental VP is very close to the critical velocity of the incident rate, 1 over P, we see that phi VDSS is almost completely controlled by incremental VP, as evidenced by the sub-horizontal contour lines at the bottom of this plot. As we increase incremental VP, the phi VDSS depends increasingly on the lower crust of VP, as evidenced by the oblique contour lines in the top part of this plot. We then did the same calculation <coughs> for higher P, P equals 0.13 second per, per kilometers. In this plot, we observe a significant decrease in phi VDSS in general, which means that a higher rate parameter would cause a lower phi VDSS. In addition, when our lower cross of VP is very close to the critical velocity, 1 over P, we, we observe that phi VDSS is almost completely controlled instead by lower cross of VP, as evidenced by the near vertical contour lines at the right, hand, at the right edge of this plot. This leads us to the conclusion that when 1 over P is close to lower cross of VP, phi VDSS is controlled by lower cross of VP. <coughs> and when 1 over P is close to the upper mental VP, phi VDSS is controlled instead by upper mental VP. The conclusion here is important because in most areas, we don't, we don't know either lower cross of VP or upper mental VP very well. Therefore, if we want to constrain upper mental VP, for example, from phi observed phi VDSS, we have to make assumption about lower cross of VP. In such case, we want to choose our rate parameter so that phi VDSS is primarily sensitive to upper mental VP, so that uh, error in our assumed lower cross of VP would have little effect in our estimation of upper mental VP. Later, I will show a real data example of estimating upper mental VP from observed phi VDSS. Now, let's move on to uh, SSPMP amplitude, A VDSS. Normally, SSPMP should always be a strong phase due to the post critical reflection. However, in few data, we sometimes do observe a diminished SSPMP amplitude. One example is the data I just shown from the Oros Plateau. So we want to explore the factors that could potentially reduce SSPMP amplitude. One reasonable guess is near surface sedimentary layer, which is known to cause severe problems in receiver function analysis. Here I'm using models with different sedimentary layer thickness to test this hypothesis. We observe that as we start putting in a sedimentary layer to our model, the amplitude of SSPMP decreases significantly. This is because when the sedimentary layer is present at the virtual source, the S2P conversion coefficient is greatly reduced. In another word, in the presence of a sedimentary layer, the efficiency or the energy of our virtual source is decreased. When we further decrease the velocity of a sedimentary layer, we observe a further decrease of SSPMP amplitude. In addition, in some extreme case, when there is a very low velocity uh, sedimentary layer, some of the sedimentary phase becomes more prominent than the SSPMP. In this green case, if we interpret this phase as SSPMP, which is actually the superposition of two sedimentary phases, we could severely underestimate crustal thickness. The take-home message for this section is that AVDSS is very hard to use because it is strongly dependent on near surface condition. Finally, let's look at Nori. I think if I remember correctly, your data set shows uh, like uh, SMPMP actually has a stronger amplitude than SS. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. Um, Can you explain with your explanation here? Um, for this part. I'm afraid it's very hard to explain it with a 1D waveform synthetics because, as I'll show later, the area around Ordos is strongly 
three D. So there, the focusing and defocusing effects caused by deep structure would cause an amplification of SPMP in some in some areas, and this is beyond my discussion today. But uh, as I have, as I have already gone to this size, for station JB thirteen, the, the amplitude is higher than JB 9 and my explanation for this decrease in amplitude is because the sedimentary layer in the Ordos Plateau increased in thickness to westward. And because the virtual source of JB13 locates to the east of JB09, it sees a shallower and higher velocity sedimentary layer than JB09. This caused a higher amplitude at JB13 than JB09. All right. Let's now go back to my slide. So let's now look at travel time. Traditionally, people thought that TVDSS is only affected by crustal structure. Here, we want to look at if sub-mohol structure may also affect TVDSS. So we built up this model to test our hypothesis. In this 2D model, we have a crust with constant thickness on top and a mantle lithosphere with very thickness below it. The mantle lithosphere is thicker in the middle and thinner on the two sides. This can represent a condition where we have a stable craton embedded, embedded in <coughs> tectonically active areas around it, such as the Ordos Plateau. We use the SpecFan 2D software package to compute the 2D synthetic waveforms. And for the source, we assume an instant plane S wave, instant from below. Here are the synthetics. This is a, this is a record section. And here are showing three separate waveforms. The striking feature observed here is that despite the constant cross thickness in our model, we have a significant variation in TVDSS across the profile. For this blue station here, the SSPMP is delayed. And for the red station here, the SSPMP arrival is advanced. This is obviously due to sub mohol structure change. Our explanation for this is that for this blue station, the SS lag of SPMP travels through lower velocity material, therefore arrives later than the direct SS. And this travel time delay would be included in TVDSS, which caused an increase in TVDSS. For this rare station, it's the opposite way. The SS lag of SSPMP travels through higher velocity material than the direct SS. And this will cause uh, advance in the SSPMP travel time. Now let's see what we just let me let's see how we how what we just learned can apply to the Ordos pro, uh, pro problem. In the Ordos, if a station sits close to the edge of the stable craton, its virtual source may locate outside the stable craton. In such case. The SS lag of SSPMP may travel through s s s lower velocity material and arrive earlier, arrive later than the direct SS. And this will cause an increased uh, SSPMP travel time, which is exactly what Chun Quan observed in his Oros data set. Thanks to the new China Ray project, the Chinese uh, ambition of emulating the US array we now have a much better constraint of SS travel time distribution around the Ordos area. In this plot, the color on each station shows the SS residual time measured against the prediction of AK-135 Earth model for an earthquake happened in the Banda Sea. Oops. I probably stepped on the wire. And the blue here means early arrival, and right here means late arrival. The, the green line here marks the profile used by Chun Quan, and the 
green rectangle marks the area where he observed an overtaken cross. For, for station sitting in this green area, its virtual source locates to the southeast of it, where we have a later SS arrival than the station. And this will cause uh, increased TVDSS for, at the, for the record recorded at this station. This, I think, could explain most of Chen Quan's observation of overtaken cross. Our next step would be to do a quantitative correction of this effect and reevaluate across the thickness in the Oros area using VDSS. Okay, now that we have learned all those knowledge about VDSS, let's see what geologic sense can we make using this new method. We are applying the VDSS method to the slave craton, which is known for the Earth's oldest rocks, the four billion years old Acasta gneiss. We choose the slave craton as our natural laboratory because its structure can be safely approximated as being 1D. We use the data recorded at station YKW3, a component of the yellow knife array, because it has decades of digital recording. In addition, it also has uh, subduction zone earthquakes in the crack range for VDSS. <coughs> the, another advantage of the slave craton is that the Canadians have done uh, a lot of ref active source reflection and refraction experiment there. The blue line here shows a lethal probe active source experiment line and we can compare our VDSS results with, uh, directly with the active source results. Moreover, we have station EDZN, a component of the Polaris array, sitting close to the SSPMP refraction point of our station YKW3. Because in receiver functions, we assume the MOHO PS conversions happens within 20 kilometers of the recording station. The receiver functions recorded at ETZN can be viewed as sampling the same cross property as the SSPMP recorded at YKW3. In another word, we can directly compare our VDSS results with both active source and receiver function results in this, re in this area. Among all the events recorded by station YKW3, we choose seven high quality deep focus events for our VDSS analysis. Here, the traces are sorted from large reparameter to small reparameter, and we can clearly observe a move out or increase of VDSS travel time with decreasing reparameter. To measure phi VDSS, we apply different phase shifts to the SS wavelet and compare it with the SSPMP observation. The phase shift that matched our observed SSPMP best is determined to be the fee VDSS. After uh, determining the fee VDSS, we measure T VDSS by cross -cor correlating our synthetic SSPMP with our observed uh, SSPMP. Here is an example. The blue curve is observed SSPMP, and the black curve is, is the best fit synthetics. The T VDSS is measured to be about 6.4 seconds, and phi VDSS is measured to be about 112 degree. We can then use T VDSS as a function of real parameter to estimate cross average VP and cross thickness. In this plot, the cyan dots shows the observed T VDSS as a function of ray parameters, which clearly shows uh, move out. And the right curves here shows the best fit cross the model. We constrain the cross of every VP to be 6.6 .6 km per second and the thickness to be 6. Sorry, 60, 38 kilometers. We can then compare our VDSS results with previous seismic other previous seismic results in this area. This is a very complicated plot, so let me walk you through it. 
the color in the background shows the VP model constrained with wide angle refraction experiments. And uh, it, the Moho determinant from the model lies uh, at about 30, 32 kilometer depth. The black fabrics in the front show the reflectivity image given by near vertical reflection seismic experiment. In near vertical reflection seismic experiment, because the moho is typically defined as a depth where the reflectivity in the crust suddenly decreases, which is marked in the dashed line here. It is clearly shown here that the reflection moho is about 37 kilometer deep, about 5 kilometer deeper than the refraction moho. Our VDSS moho is plotted here at the estimated reflection point. It, it, as it's shown here, it agrees pretty well with the reflection moho, but it's significantly deeper than the refraction moho. In addition, we also compute the receiver function for station EDZN, which lies close to our VDSS reflection points. The receiver functions are, are move out and stacked uh, to form a stack receiver function. We then convert the stack receiver function to depth domain so that it is directly comparable to our VDSI results. The receiver function shows the moho at about 37 kilometer, agreeing pretty well with both reflection moho and the VDSI moho. The overall agreement between the three methods shown here indicates the robustness of our VDSS analysis. <laughs> and one explanation for the shallower refraction moho is the trade-off between the moho, moho depth and average VP. Here we can see that the average VP uh, estimated from refraction experiments is, is significantly lower than average VP uh, estimated from VDSS. Now, we can also use observed phi VDSS as a function of gray parameter to constrain incremental velocity. The cyan diamonds here shows the observed phi VDSS, which clearly show a decreasing trend with real parameter. We, to, con to constrain the incremental VP, we compute different theoretical curves with different upper mental uh, uh, velocity and a fixed lower crustal velocity. And the comparison between the theoretical curves and the observation shows the upper mental VP in our study area to be 8 to, be eight to 8 8.1 kilometer per second. We then compare our upper mental VP with the upper mental VP derived with the active source refraction results. The comparison shows a very good uh, agreement between the two results. And you may ask whether the assumed lower cross VP could uh, affect our estimated upper mental VP. So we also compute different of the uh, theoretical curves with a very lower cross VP. Here it shows that the curves are very close to each other, meaning that our estimated upper mental VP is, does, is not very much affected by our assumed lower cross VP. This is because the reciprocal of the real parameter here, or the critical velocity, is much higher than lower cross VP. So that lower cross VP actually has little effect in phi VDSS in our case here. Now, after we have, con we have constrained the cross VP and the cross thickness, we want to go further to see if we, we can also constrain cross average VP vs ratio because this property is closely related to cross composition. Traditionally, people estimate K by using the receiver function HK stacking method. Here is how HK stacking works. It maximizes the stacking energy by, by great, it, it, it search for the cross thickness and K that maximizes stacking energy of the moho PS conversion in receiver functions and the two moho multiples. Here we apply the traditional HK stacking method 
to the receiver function is recorded at station EDZN. The H and the K found, are found to be 37 km and 1.75, respectively. Although HK method achieve uh, pretty good results at station EDZN, I have to say that there are two main shortcomings for the traditional HK method. First, it relies on the two MOHO multiples on receiver functions, which are not always robustly observed. Secondly, it requires the average cross of VP as an input parameter, which needs to be constrained independently. So we want to propose a new method of estimating K, which is based on a joint analysis between VDSS and receiver function. Here is how it works. First, we measure the MOHO PS arrival time from the stack receiver function. This is quite simple. And then we estimate the cross of average VP, average VP and H from our VDSS analysis. And finally, combining those three parameters, we should be able, we will be able to estimate the cross of average VP VS ratio. Applying this new method to our slave Kraton data set, we find the cross thickness of 38 kilometers and the K of 1.74. This agrees very well with the H and K found with the traditional HK method. In addition to the good agreement, there are two advantages of our new method. First, it only relies on the arrival time of MOHO PS conversion on receiver function which is the most robust uh, observable of receiver functions. And secondly, our method is capable of estimate average cross of VP and K simultaneously, which cannot be done in traditional HK stacking method. Finally, let's see if we can go one step further to use our measure VP vs ratio and average cross of VP to constrain the cross of composition in the slave craton. In this plot, the color image shows the joint distribution of our constrained cross of average VP and the cross of VP VS ratio. It clearly shows a negative trade-off between the two parameters. The diamonds with, color with arrow bars in the front shows the measurement of VP and the VP VS ratio for typical crustal rocks and the data was derived from the famous Christensen 1996 paper. And we can clearly observe a positive trade-off between VP and VP vs ratio in those rock samples. As we increase the silica content in the rock samples, both VP vs ratio and VP decrease. And because the trend of the rock property and our sizing measurement are almost orthogonal to each other, the cross of composition in the slave craton can be constrained tightly at the intersection between the two trends. This shows uh, intermediate or diuretic composition of this area. Now, we want to compare our results with re observations from other cratons in the world. Here I'm showing a paper on the Western Australia craton. In 2012, an uh, author from Australia published these results showing a negative correlation be between bulk cross of VP vs ratio and cross of H in the Western Australia craton. So Dawes here are uh, his measurements using the traditional receiver function HK stacking method and the grid uh, arrow shows the general trend he observed. In the slave craton, the Acasta Nice, the oldest rock ever found on the Earth, shows uh, Eo-Archean age. However, <clears throat> when we compare our results with the trend derived from the Western Australia Craton, we found a much younger age than the Acasta Nice, as shown by the intersection between our result and the Western Australia trend here. There are several possible explanations for this. First, the Acasta Nice might not be representative of the bulk crust in the slave craton. The earliest rock of the earliest crustal rock of the slave craton may form in Eoarchean. However, later on, 
extensive reworking of the crustal material might have completely reset the age of the slave craton to a much younger time. And secondly, another possibility is that the trend Yuan, Yuan found in Western Australia craton may not apply to the slave craton. To prove or disprove either argument, we have to do a more comprehensive study on the slave craton and also other cratons in the world. This leads me to my conclusions. First, fee VDSS can give us estimation of upper mantle VP. And secondly, T VDSS can give us cross thickness and cross average VP. Finally, a joint analysis of VDSS and receiver function can give us cross average VP VS ratio and a cross average composition. Most of my presentation today is about application of VDSS under 1D assumption. And the obvious next step will be to understand the behavior of post-critical SSPMP in the presence of lateral heterogeneity. And this is my ongoing work at this point. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tianzhe, for your very inform informative talk. Now you have the expert for deeper sea imaging, and Rob may have hard questions for you. Sure. Do you? <laughs> no, not questions, but I enjoyed your talk. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm just curious, in your last slide there, yeah, the other data points you're showing, do you have a correlation estimate for those? Because clearly in your inversion technique, mm -hmm. you have a very strong negative correlation in the estimate. I'm just curious whether those other determinations have a similar negative correlation, or do they actually have a positive? Oh, you mean like uh, the correlation between average VP and the cross of yeah. thickness? Uh, I think for VDSS, the correlation will be positive. Yeah, uh, I didn't calculate that, but previous study, study has shown that conclusion. Yeah. But certainly the negative correlation here is a very important feature of our, our method. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, so I have a question also about um, this part of the HK stacking. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a very good question. For the arrow, I would say it's, it's a, a, of the same order of magnitude as the traditional HK method, though I'm not, though I'm not showing it here. But uh, apparently, it's not quite easy to determine arrow range for the two methods because I think most of the times people give arrows, but they estimate them in very different ways. So when we compare arrow of one method with the arrow given by another, usually we're just comparing oranges mm -hmm. to apples. And my sense was that in the past studies, for example, this one, the arrows for the HK stacking is usually underestimated. And here we see the arrows for the HK method is within most, most of the points are below plus minus 0.1, I would say. However, if you look at the stacking energy in this plot, the ellipse around the maximum clearly shows a much higher arrow than what is shown here. So I wouldn't comment too much on the comparison between the arrow of the two methods because it's really hard to build that um, comparison. Thanks for the talk. I, I got two questions. The first one is that you mentioned you were, you were using like the focus first plate. Yes. I'm wondering why. The, sec the second question is that, because the BDVS as the conversion point is also a little far away from the station. Mm -hmm. So does that mean the heterogeneous cross also affect BDSS more than receiver function? Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. First, um, why I'm using only deep focus, focus events? This is because we want to avoid interference of the depth, depth phases of shallower, shallow events. Um, let's look at our example from slave craton. Here, we, we observe that the 
source time function of a deep focus events are usually very simple. Mm -hmm. But most of the times, it can be ap approximated as the first derivative of a Gaussian wavelet. However, if we have shallow events, then its depth phases will arrive in the same time range as SSPMP. Then that would interfere with our with the phase we want to analyze. And in the past, in the past, Chun Quan has introduced a method to <coughs> deconvolve the source time function from our um, from from the VDSS uh, measurements. That's certainly a very useful technique. However, a major disadvantage of applying that technique is that the deconvolution pro pro procedure would uh, distort the phase uh, measurement. And that will make the measurement of phi VDSS impossible, although we may still be able to extract travel time information from the convolution results. That's for the, your first question. And secondly, <coughs> the lateral heterogeneity, yes. VDSS is, is more sensitive to lateral heterogeneity than receiver function because the virtual source usually locates further away from the station. However, that's a trade-off we have to make. In receiver function, although lateral heterogeneity has little effect, the trace also have low signal-noise ratio due to the low amplitude of the PS conversion. However, in VDSS, although we are suffering more about we, uh, more from the lateral heterogeneity, we by measuring the wide angle phase, we are having much higher amplitude than in receiver function. So there are pros and cons for both methods. Nori? I have following a question about this. So this one, because like your P horizontal slowness is not constant anymore because of that structure. So can you estimate actually P from your data itself? Like yes. Array? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's actually the paper I'm working on right now. You know, so the lateral heterogeneity would cause uh, lateral variation in arrival time. And because real parameter is just uh, a spatial derivative of travel time, that variation in travel time would also cause lateral variation in real parameter. And in cases where we have a dense array, such as the synthetics here, we can actually use the derivative of the observed uh, travel time to estimate the real parameter. And uh, I'm proposing a new method of making use of that piece of information to image the moho in my in the paper I'm working on right now. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.